The scripture text for today is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 16. If you're able to, would you stand for the reading of the word? Philippians 3, starting with verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may load, lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if anything, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. You may be seated. Well, may the blessing of God be upon you as you give us God's word. Good morning. I'm glad you are here and glad that I am here and glad that Lee and I have drank the same Kool-Aid this morning. Or maybe I should rather say in a church sense, we have drunk from the same chalice. <laughs> I want to, I love the, the songs that the worship team sang this morning, but I also want to recognize particularly the song, Jesus, Be My Center, because that is the cry, I believe, of our hearts. There are so many things that I have to share with you this morning. You can see the title of our message. I've got the I want in brackets. Because the real title is more of Christ's life, but personally, each of us must want that as believers before it, all of us can have that together. So uh, as we go through this morning, I, I recognize there are a lot of interesting things going on in our hearts and our minds. and. So I just want to kind of capstone maybe several of them in the midst of all of this. I want to start out this morning by sharing with you a story, which I always like to do. And it, it seems as though there was a group of people who were touring an ice cream factory. This was not a small factory. In fact, every time they made a certain kind of ice cream, and of course, most of you know that mine always has to have nuts in it, preferably pecans or walnuts, because I love butter pecan ice cream and I love maple walnut ice cream, preferably black walnut or black, black, uh, yeah, walnut ice cream. Anyway, 
they were touring this factory, and this one little guy got himself kind of lost in the factory, and he was away from the whole group, and and he was on one of the scaffolds over one of these huge vats of ice cream, and he he recognized it was his favorite kind. And as he was looking at it, as it's kind of gelling or cooling down, he slipped and fell into the vat of ice cream. And he looked towards heaven and he said, Lord, I've only got, I've only got two things to pray for right now. He said, first, give me a spoon. And second, I pray that my stomach is up to the occasion. I have often found myself in a particular type of prophetic ministry. And that prophetic ministry is challenge. And I've also recognized that many times the type of challenge that I am involved in in congregational life is not just individual, but it's actually corporate challenge. Think of how many sermons you have heard in the last number of years that the particular focus was simply on the congregation as a whole versus individual challenges that are often coming out of Scripture in that format. So, with that in mind, I am just going to move into our sermon time this morning. I would believe that it is the normal desire of every growing Christian to have more of Christ's life. Perhaps it would be a good time to ask as well, is it even possible for a Christian to continue to receive more of Christ's life even into the fuller stages of spiritual maturity? And then I think of this question. Does the situation in which a Christian receives more of Christ's life always occur the way you had hoped? Think about that. Eliza M. Hickok, in a poem that I don't know how I learned it, but I did, says this. I guess so. She says this, I know not by what methods rare, but this I know God answers prayer. I know not if the blessing sought will come in just the guise I thought, so I'll leave my prayer to him alone whose will is wiser than my own. Now I, I put this those words on a slide and behind the words Can you see what's there? A series of arches. Those arches happened to be on Fort Jefferson, an island that was built by the Civil War uh, Union Army, 70 miles west of Key West, Florida. And I just share that with you in case you want to verify where I got the picture. But I was there this summer and took this picture. And there's a perspective You and I see these first couple of arches pretty well, but as we look down the distance, we're not sure what all is there. And I think Eliza M. Hickok has captured the fact that in that last line, so I leave my prayer to him alone whose will is wiser than my own. In this 1970s Christian gospel singer-songwriter lyric, Andre Crouch would sing, My troubles only come to make me strong. If I never had a problem, I'd never know that God could solve them. Through them all, through them all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. More of Christ's life in and out of the more difficult areas of a Christian's life. Is that quote a possibility? It is. If I move from the personal aspects of an individual Christian's life 
Is not the same thing true of corporate, local body of Christ life? And I would simply ask this question. Do the hopes of a congregation always come in the way we think? As I turn to our text, the context of our text is found in verses 1 to 6, which I chose not to read, but I want to summarize. Where the Apostle Paul uh, states his Jewish pedigree, how he had viewed, had viewed his zeal for God, and how he had viewed obtaining righteousness for himself. Then, as a very seasoned apostle, pastor, evangelist, and church planter, he writes to us in verses 7 to 8, these words. You can look at them in your Bible text if you'd like as I read them. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as lost for the sake of Christ. Moreover, Then, moreover than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And he goes on, whom I suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish in order that I may, may, that I may gain Christ. What a thought. He recognizes his Jewish pedigree. He recognizes how he had viewed before coming to Christ, his zeal for Christ. Or maybe we could even say he, as he was growing, he realized the more important virtues of how zeal is expressed. And he also gave up, in a sense, how he viewed obtaining righteousness for himself. And then verses 10 and 11 he goes on and he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death and being conformed to his death is that he gave it all up for Christ like Christ gave it all up for us so that he could know Christ better. It's interesting that I may know him is a conditional phrase based on viewing all things in one's life as less important in value compared to receiving more of Christ. Among other things, his Jewish pedigree, how he had viewed zeal for God and how he had viewed obtaining righteousness all of those, among other things, were less important, far less important to him now than seeking the fullness of Christ. As I thought about ourselves as a congregation, I wondered how that might look for us. And I ask myself, and I will ask you, the congregation, how much of our work as listed in the 16th Sunday School Dialogue session last month figure into what may be in Paul's thinking, things that we may need to give up in order to have more of Christ's life in our congregational life as it relates to merging or blending with another congregation for wanting more of Christ's life through and into the blending process is very, very important work. You have a handout that I gave to you, and I'll, I don't have it on the screen, but you have a handout in your... Uh, and I, I just want to, for the moment, look at some of those things with you. If I can get my phone to switch the way I hoped it would. 
Okay. There we go. I would like you to look down on the first page to a, a darkened area that says our work. And it says this, as we now have congregational direction, and our focus will be to for, uh, uh, congregational direction of, of merging with another congregation, that possibility, uh, our focus is to first list and think through what uh, are the emotional uh, what an emotionally mature, spiritually successful merger with another congregation would look like? And there are broad, there's a number of things in a broad category, and they include these. Hands-off versus hands-on control. How does ours, that is, Boyertown Mennonite churches, and theirs, other congregation, become jointly shared and owned? What are the healthy ways to blend two families, house, two households? Financial issues, merging of our reserves. Four, the use and maintenance of cemetery and other property issues areas. Five, what are minor versus major theological issues in merging two possibly different theological, historical theological groups into a new group, unity? And what are personal preferences versus not tolerable ones? What might we see as emotionally healthy principles to challenge each of us in the merging process? Seven, what are we feeling as we embark upon a very unique yet challenging time and possibility? Eight, why is the concept of merging easier to receive than the practice of its implementation? How do our feelings and the ideas of our space contribute to the challenge? Number nine, bringing together the merging of organizational structures, ministry-focused activities, outside benevolences, that is, persons and organizations which we financially support beyond our own ministry building and property financial needs. How do those all figure into this kind of a thing. And I would just mention them under this guise of what is Christ saying to us about what we need to give up so that we can have the, a greater fullness of Jesus both in personal life and in corporate congregational life. In verse 12, the seasoned apostle Paul writes, Not that I have already attained it. And I would ask, is he saying, is he, is he not saying that there is more to come in his seasoned life and that when we think we are giving something up, it is then at that point that room is created for the more of Christ's life. I have not yet already attained it. Is the idea of giving up, is that idea of giving up that I thought of it is in that that I thought of a financial analogy, and, and, and here it is. Can I have the next? Thank you. Financial investing works the same way. If a person wants to cat his cash to grow, putting one's cash under the mattress will not grow more cash. At least I've not found that to be the case. However, if a person gives his cash up to a financial institution, it is then that the cash has the capability to grow. Christ teaches this principle within the, within the parable of the money usage in John, and Luke 19. He talks about a landowner going on a journey and he gave to one 
ten talents or amounts of minas and another five and another one. And it's very interesting that the one said, oh, what happens if I lose it in giving it up? And so he holds on to it selfishly, hands clutched. And when the landowner returned, who received the blessing and who didn't? The prophet Malachi suggests the same principle when Malachi counsels Israel to bring the tithes into the storehouse and see if he, God, will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so that it overflows. More will not take place, Malachi seems to be saying, unless we offer it completely to God. Now this is where Lee and I must have drank from the same chalice. Because King David in Psalm 37, 3 and 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And this Old Testament equivalent is equivalent of wanting more of Christ and his life means giving up other things to seek the kingdom of God first. Luke 6.33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. All of these things will be added unto you. In the midst of all of this, I took a look back at the areas we had listed in our process discernment work in our Sunday school dialogue sessions several months ago. Things or situations hoped for and here are some of them first we talked about wanting young families we talked about a full complement of for all ages Sunday school because we were only using what maybe 20% of our building availability for actually doing the work of getting the word into our hearts and lives. We talked about children running around our building and property, and that's in a good way. <laughs> we talked about a sanctuary full of worshipers. We talked about, about both younger, older and younger women who want to learn how to quilt and not, although we didn't specifically say that I have been around my dear sisters long enough when i not with them. I say quilt, I meant not. When i not with them, K-N-O-T, not N-O-T. That they would love to teach this wonderful craft to others. A place where our historic spiritual labors may be used in a greater way for Christ and his kingdom. A more complete way towards reaching the unsaved in the Boyertown area. A full-time pastor. A numerically growing in size congregation. As I looked over all of those things, I asked our Lord this question. Lord, is this what you have purposed for us as we as a congregation in our discernment to join together with an emerging congregation? Is that what you want for us? As we count all things as loss, those things to which we have become so accustomed as a smaller, maturing and age congregation, we look at these areas for the purpose of receiving the surpassing value of knowing more of Jesus Christ and his life in us. Paul closes his reflection in his personal life in this way. 
I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. Let us therefore, as many as are mature or perfect, mature is the better word, let therefore let each of us, as many as be mature, have this attitude. And if anything you and, and if any if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. However, let us keep living that same way, that same standard to which we have attained. And I think of that psalm in closing, and I don't have its reference, where David simply says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Would you bow with me for prayer? Heavenly Father, for the goodness of your love and grace, I give you thanks. Ah, yes, Lord, there are many things that are a part of wanting to obtain a fuller measure of your life in our lives and in our congregation. I simply ask, Lord, that you would just help us as we ponder what and how are the best ways to do that to the enlargement of the kingdom of Christ in the Boyertown area. And I will simply say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for you are revealing it to your saints here and helping us as we move in the direction of where we think you are leading. In Jesus' name, amen.